Peace. Put a little smile on the back, huh? And it, a bit. All right. Thank you. Bump up to twenty five percent. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be very good. Mm -hmm. Probably can't even get a little smaller than that. You're not using Fira code anymore. Hmm. No, no I've got it on VS Code. I don't have. Oh, it gotcha. It. Because the amount of time that I spend in Visual Studio these days is virtually zero, since I'm doing entirely node development. Now. Node way. Node way. So, everybody, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Dave Fancher. Uh, I'm a former Microsoft MVP, been around the national speaking circuit a bit, and tonight we are going to talk about asynchronous development in .NET, which is really funny since I have not been doing .NET development in quite some time. This talk is a little different than a lot of the talks that I do. Rather than doing a deep dive on asynchronous programming in .NET and talking about the underlying architectures and, and whatnot, this is more of a history lesson. And like, okay, you can read blog post after blog post about async and await and tasks and whatnot, but I think in order for us to truly appreciate the state of asynchronous programming in .NET today, it really pays to go and revisit some of the ways that we ha used to have to do things, see some of the pitfalls that we would encounter, see how the current approaches address some of those, but not all of them, and so how these things that would always get in the way and, and just be generally troublesome and problematic, making asynchronous programming difficult to something that is readily accessible and available today. So just kind of setting that expectation a little bit, and we're going to go through a simple example, <clears throat> relatively simple example of taking an image and resizing it. So, you know, say you're working on a website or something that you allow users to upload some image and you want it to be available in a variety of sizes. So your user may select that image and then when you receive it, you do some processing against it and write it out somewhere in those different sizes. It seems like, yeah, we could make our users wait for that process to finish, but <coughs> depending on the size of the content, depending on how many different resolutions we want, that can be a rather time consuming process. So do we really want the user's browser or end application to sit there spinning, waiting for that process to finish, or do we want to push that off to some other process to allow it to work and get a response back to our users faster? We're gonna work with a single image tonight, so I work over in Fishers, and <clears throat> convenient for me is my favorite coffee shop is about a block away, and I spend entirely too much money over there, but they've got a really interesting building, so if you're not down in, in Fishers that often, or uh, you probably aren't familiar with that nickel plate district, but these older buildings, and I absolutely love the way that they have that it just kind of sits around there. It's a brick building, and they decorated the back. So this is the image. I just love the, the composition there. So this is the image we're going to do. We're going to see this image pop up a few times throughout the evening. But we're going to take this. This is the full resolution image, and we're going to create a couple of different sizes. And throughout the evening, we're going to work through a series of examples, just building. We're going to start off with a synchronous example and then work through the evolution of asynchronous programming methodologies in .NET. So setting a baseline, let's look at a synchronous example. Just going to go and show the code on this real quick. So all of these are going to exhibit some similar patterns. But essentially, we have a run method. 
we instantiate an image processor, and then we iterate over the ratios that we want to generate. We write out some information, we resize, and we create a new, or we, we do the, the resize again, using that image processor, write out some more messages, and write out the file. When we run that, you see how this thing is kind of taking its time chugging along. It's doing these all in the order of the different percentages in the array. We'll see pretty much what we'd expect. 100% done resizing, saving, done saving. Resizing to 75, done resizing, saving. <coughs> you know, and it took almost four seconds to do that. And just to prove that it's working, let's look out in this folder. And I'll turn on dimensions here. Bear with me. Dimensions. So we can see all of these files are named, for those in the back, I'll read it, 404 by 303, and that corresponds to the dimensions captured in the metadata. We can open up any of these. Sure enough, that's a lot smaller. And that's about 100% zoom, and then the others we already saw. But we can see that it's doing its, its work. We'll revisit this a few times as we go through. I'll come back to it often, because we've seen that these different components are working together. So way back at the beginning of .NET, we're talking about ancient .NET history here, 1.0, 1.1 days. We had no choice. We needed to do anything with asynchronous programming. Which primitives did we have to use? Were you doing coding back then or even today? Um, what did you have to use to, to offload something as another process? Um, we had to use instance of thread. Yes. We needed to do threading. Right. Working with the thread primitives directly. So we see in this, we're following the same basic process, right? Create our new process. We actually supply it in this one. This is just to do resize. Let me scroll down so we can see the start of it. There we go. So we run. We create our processor. We iterate over the ratios. But inside, we create a new thread. I'm not going to talk about the delegates involved in this. This isn't really a, a delegate talk, but thread, we have to give it some operation. And then we have to start the thread. That resize operation, this is the same code, it's just been moved around, refactored into another, into another method. We log out our warning, we'll come back to our comment here. We create our new image with the resize, and we do all the same stuff we were doing before. But as that comment says, uh-oh, we have one of two possibilities of how this thing is going to break. Let me run it. Oh, parameter is not valid. So that's the first case. What might be going wrong here? Any ideas? So in this model, uh, when you pass the uh, parameters, there are going to be object. So here we're talking about first, uh, there is no uh, well-defined, uh, uh, what's called, there is no, uh, the parameters are not, you would not be able to, to guess the parameter type? Nope. Nope, because we are fully qualifying all of our parameters in here for what's supplied. Okay. And the action that I've supplied, it's just a, it just takes no parameters. We're just passing in, or for the, for the thread, when we look at it, mm -hmm. we see no parameters, okay. and we call do resize with the instantiated processor, mm -hmm. the output folder path, and whatever mm -hmm. ratio we're trying to go to. So those are all well-defined. We see them all up at the top. 
processor as an image processor, output folder path as a string, and ratio as a double. So it knows exactly what it's working with here. What else? Any other ideas? If that ratio, this much get passed in as a pointer, and that pointer is no longer valid by the time it's used? Close. Close. Processor. What is processor? Processor is an image processor. And if we look at our run method, how are we instantiating processor? Run file with using. What does using do? Uh, you define scope. So garbage collects it. Gar it disposes it. When does it dispose it? Mm -hmm. Right here. Mm -hmm. What are we doing with the thread? Still running. The thread is running. This thread that kicked off the thread has completed. Therefore, processor dispose. It goes away. So therefore, we can no longer use that. So. How would we address that? Well, singletons. <laughs> Yay, singletons. Actually, that would be my functional example. But uh, let's go look at the image processor. Oops. And so the image processor. Resize. Actually, actually, nope, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of my example. We need a way to control when the image processor is disposed of. Now, these are things we have to keep track of. I'm sorry, I was getting ahead of my example. We need a way to control when that is disposed of. We go to the next example. Since I'm not going to do the code here, I'm just going to go to the example itself. Let's stop this. Go back to our program. And we'll look at a working thread example. But I'm going to make one quick change in here. So one of the plethora of ways that we can control when the processor is disposed is by introducing one of any number of blocking constructs. In this case, I've chosen the countdown event. Countdown event maintains a counter of essentially number of items of work to complete. This one, I'm initializing it with however many ratios I'm going to use. I know I'm going to be kicking off, in this case, five different threads. So I'm going to wait until all of those complete. We see in here, countdown.signal. That says decrement one. This thing is finished, decrement it. These things are still going to keep running. We get down here, we see countdown.wait. And it says, until this counter reaches zero, block this thread. So all those things can keep doing their processing. When that countdown reaches zero, wait says, OK, I'm at zero, continue on. Then it can dispose. So what happens when I run this one? Just made a change a minute ago. We should see the other error that we saw in the previous example. Sure enough, object is currently in use elsewhere. Any ideas where that's coming from? <laughs> See, the processor not terrific. <laughs> the stack trace is very, very helpful here. And it shows do resize, which is where we are. <coughs> and it shows my run. So it's not really helping. Stack trace isn't helping. It's going to be the image itself. So this is a .NET framework project. And I'm using the built-in image types, which are not thread safe. Because reasons. Uh, maintaining memory buffers and, and whatnot, it's doing those all on its own, whatever it happens to be. So this is another pitfall that we can run into 
when we have things that aren't thread safe. I have two different threads trying to use the same image, the same object in memory. It's not thread safe, and it has inherently built in things that say, oh, you're trying to access this from multiple threads. I'm not going to let you do that, so therefore, object is currently in use elsewhere. So, yet another little obstacle with this type of programming. Let's go take a look at what this thing looks like. This is where I started getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Do resize. New bitmap, <laughs> source image, scale with source image, and ratio. Yeah, <coughs> we just saw object is currently in use elsewhere. Doesn't really work. So now I get this resize safe. I'm going to uncomment these after I stop. In order to guard against multiple threads accessing this bitmap, we need to introduce yet another construct. Let me get the cursor out of the way. This is a lock. Lock is syntactic sugar over another multi threading uh, primitive called a monitor. If you've ever tried to use a monitor directly, it's ugly, and so that's why we use lock. It wraps this thing up for us nicely and it guards against it. Now there's all sorts of headaches that come along with using lock, because most people, when they first start trying to use lock, they want to lock on this, and that can cause all sorts of other problems. So we define another object called sync root, and it doesn't do anything but give us a thing to lock on. But this is going to say, as whatever thread is executing, oh, we're getting into a spot that has some shared memory. Don't let anybody else in until we leave this scope. And then the threads just kind of back up behind it. When they're done, we get into our countdown. We signal that thing. <clears throat> but it's allowing us to control how things can access this shared bit of memory. Now that we've got our countdown, and now that we have our lock, we have our controlled access, let's run this thing again. And I was still running, apparently. Nope, nope, I wasn't afraid to change the back. There we go. New thread. There we go. Resize, save. A little bit better. Now it runs. We've gone through all of the resizes. But notice the sequence is different this time. Instead, the first time where we had a successful run, Resizing to 100%, done resizing, saving, done saving. And then that was very sequential. These, because we're offloading it into multiple processes, resizing, 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 resizing. We see all the same ratios, but then interlaced between is when it completes, when the other messages are being written out. So notice something else. The elapsed time. Remember what it was the first time we ran this? Uh, three seconds. Yeah, about four seconds. It was 3.9 seconds. Mm -hmm. This is 1.95 seconds. Right. So by spawning this work, all this work onto separate threads, we are able to take more advantage of our underlying system resources, let our system do more work simultaneously, resize those images, and give us a response back and give, allow us to give, us a response, give you a response back to our user much faster. So let's close that down. That's great. But creating a new thread is an expensive operation as far as the system is, is concerned. There's a lot of work that it needs to do to schedule that thread with the operating system and, and a variety of other things going on behind the scenes. So for that reason, we have this thing called a thread pool. You guys familiar with connection pooling in SQL Server? 
basically the same thing, except instead of reusing a connection to the database, you're reusing a thread that's already been allocated and scheduled. So this code should look very familiar. It's almost identical to what we had before, except instead of doing a new thread, we're doing thread pool .q user work item. Everything else is basically the same. We're going to say, hey.net, you've got this series of threads out there. Let me use one that's free. And we run that. And this one actually had a backfire on me because it went a little bit slower this time. Who knows what my virtual machine is doing? <laughs> yeah, who knows what this machine is doing, I guess. Let's do that. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's not behaving on me tonight, so I should probably reboot this machine one of these days. But we see with just a minor tweak to the code, we've changed the way that we create threads. And generally, unless you have a good reason, you want to use the thread pool. If you have a good reason to create a new thread and manage that thing lifetime on your own, by all means, do it. But use the one that's already created and, and let the system handle all of the allocations and everything else going on behind the scenes. Hey, yeah. How many CPUs do you have assigned to this virtual machine? I don't remember. That might limit the number. If, if it's one, yeah. I think no, it's, it's more than one. one. Yeah, it's more than one. I think I've got. I, I, I don't remember though. Yeah. Every other time I've done the example, it's worked properly. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the user work item is generally when you're working with a thread primitive. Instead of managing that lifecycle, new thread, and all that, we just use the, the thread pool, and that gets us to the same result in a little bit, a little bit more usable way. Another thing that the uh, queue user work item does is we notice that it, we're accepting a state. So I'm not actually using that, but this allows us to feed additional information into, <coughs> into the threading. But I'm not using it, so we'll In all the examples we've seen so far, one could easily argue that we are violating some single responsibility because I'm doing multiple things. I'm resizing an image and I'm saving it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I really hate it when APIs dictate how I work with the data that I'm passing around. I was working with a Oh, I wish I could remember what it, exactly what it was now. Um, oh, it was a CSV library a number of years ago. And this particular library decided that everything I wanted to do with a CSV file required a file system. That's great when you're in the cloud and don't know where your what file system is available to you. So if you're on a desktop application, Okay, yeah, you probably have some access to the, the to the underlying file system, but if you're in the cloud and you don't know where things necessarily go, how much space is allocated to you, that can be a bit of a problem. All that would have taken to fix that was to say, hey, I'm going to give you back a stream and let you figure out what to do with the stream. But yeah, that's not what these API authors did. So. The examples we've seen so far are doing basically that. They're saying, oh, you're going to give me an image and a uh, ratio, and I'm going to write it to the file system. I'm going to resize it and write that one to the file system instead of letting you decide what to do with the result. So we're going to bounce back and forth between the two approaches for the rest of the talk. But I want to show if you wanted to do something different you know, or be able to substitute what operation is done after the resize, I'll show you how to do that in the, the classic threading model. And we've got a couple of people in here that have done some JavaScript, right? It's like callbacks. Yeah, no, not so much, but that's how you do it. Oh. Now the do resize 
takes three parameters. We've got an image processor, a ratio, and an action as our callback. So we're just going to swap and say, when you're done resizing this, do whatever this other action says. And all this is doing is shuffling some code around. So all the same stuff we've already seen, but we say do resize using the processor, using the current ratio, save the file. We forward on the output folder path, and we forward down, forward along the countdown. Why do we give the countdown to save file instead of doing it inside of this lambda? Why would we do it after do resize? Why do we pass it off to, to save file and let that callback do the same? Well, right. We want to defer disposing. We want to defer signaling the countdown to unblock the thread until after we're done saving. Otherwise, you know, maybe this process terminates and the file doesn't get written. So we wait until we're done saving all of the files. It's useful. So it just does the same signal, passing in that countdown reference. When that countdown reaches zero, we unblock and the process can continue. I'll run this one. There's some extra dispatching and things that go on with the callback. So this one I would expect to take a little bit longer. Actually, what's funny is that now that this one has the dispatching going on, the uh, time is 2.36 instead of 2.7. So I don't know what was going on. I do like to watch how these, these numbers come back. But that extra dispatching, we've got you know, the multicast delegate for the action. It takes a little extra work, but it allows us to control the flow a little bit better. Now, about that same time, so back at the beginning of .NET time, we had all these threads and thread pools, and we could use callbacks and all these great things to do some parallel or asynchronous processing. But Microsoft said, hey, instead of doing that, <coughs> let us handle all of the threading stuff for you, because we're smarter than you or something. And so they came up with this thing called the asynchronous programming model. Anybody use this? Yeah, notice I have deprecated in parentheses after that. Aside from the fact that things like the task parallel library exist, this thing fell out of favor in a hurry, but I included it just for, for completeness here. If you're looking through some legacy code and you see things like async callback, that we see here on line 29, or async result. All of this stuff is signaling that you're using this asynchronous programming model. And all of this stuff is built off of this delegate of, um, uh, what, oh, whatever the delegate was, I can't remember the site name. Um, but you have all this begin invoke and end invoke nonsense. Basically, start running this thing on a new thread, and when you're done, do this. Basically hooking up your callback, but in a very verbose way. Just to set the stage a bit, I'm going to jump back to the previous example. We see we have you know, essentially 65 lines of code, and we queue a user work item, pass in a state, do the resize, call save file. APM with delegates. This starts off pretty similar. We still have our countdown, but now we've introduced this new resize delegate, which I've defined up at the top. doesn't really matter. But it exposes the begin invoke and end invoke. So begin invoke. Use the processor, here's the ratio, here's the save image. Okay. 
do resize, now we say I resize save, and we return a new image. So our return type up here was void before, but now we're returning an image. Because one of the arguments to this, the third argument, is a type I'll read from the back, async callback. So we provide that third parameter, which looks just like we saw in the previous example, save image, passing an output path and countdown. So when it returns an image, then we get into this thing that returns an async callback. So we're getting more and more types involved in this. And in order to use this, because this was at a time before we had things like generics, we couldn't specify a generic type on async result or whatever the uh, return for the async delegate is. So we had to do some casting around here, get our result, and then do some more you know, do some more of the processing we saw before. But there's a lot of extra stuff that goes on, a lot more moving parts to manage. So generally, this fell out of favor in a hurry. So if you're going to do this, just use the thread pool and get on with life. We get so far? Is that possibly faster than the thread pool, but more complex? It, it no, it was. Uh, my understanding is it was about the same. I don't really remember again. It, it kind of fell out of favor because there were there's just a lot of needless complexity to it. Um, I think the argument was there's a little more architectural structure to it, though. Right? Yeah, yeah, but because we didn't have much support from the type system, there was all that extra work you had to do just to understand what was actually returned from the begin invoke in order to do the callback. And then, again, you start, it, it didn't alleviate things like callback hell. So if you had to chain multiple operations together, you had you know double, nested callbacks, and, and it was just ugly. It looked kind of like JavaScript pre-async await. <laughs> so yeah, I, I never, my, my software at the time, I never really had to go down that path. And you know most of the stuff I was doing, I didn't really need writing a whole lot. Different, you know, different world today, but fortunately, we have better tools for that today. So with this understanding, this knowledge of how to work with the threading primitives directly, realizing that the world is changing, we now have, you know, we're no longer working with machines that, oh, you want to get more work done, you go buy a new computer with Faster CPU, yeah, CPU cycle, you know, CPU times haven't really gotten any faster. They've been scaling outwards, right? More cores. Uh, ultimately, though, our software needed to keep up because we're running single-threaded applications. We're not taking advantage of those underlying resources. And as the world moves more to these things that have strict requirements about how much you can monopolize the UI thread, how much work you have to you have to offload, and if you exceed those thresholds, you get kicked out of the app store for whatever your platform is. It's increasingly important to write code in a parallel or asynchronous way. So then Microsoft says, all this stuff is great, but it's really hard to do. We have to worry about all this, this thread lifetime management and, and all the stuff that we've seen, you know, shared memory access, things like the countdowns or the semaphores or any of those other blocking mechanisms to manage all of that interaction between these different processes. So there's got to be a better way. Fortunately, this time, we as an industry had learned a few things and realized that there were certain use cases for these approaches. And out of that work came the Task Parallel Library. I can't remember, was it 3.5, I think, or 4.0? I think it was 4.0 when Task Parallel Library. I don't remember, I think it was 4. 3.5, no, 3 was link, and then 3.5 was, or I'm sorry, and 4, I think, was, was uh, all of this uh, parallelization work. Yeah, you know, I think 35 had language features. It was just a yeah, I think, bunch of add on DLL. Yeah, and I, and I don't remember the, uh, entirely what came up like, but 3.0 was, was Link and all of the, the magnificence that came with that. 
and four's killer feature was a new way to think about asynchronous programming. So I'm going to do two of these examples, if you will, in parallel. Huh. And I'm using some link in here because I love link. But the easiest way, depending on what you're doing, is if you're really just needing to parallelize how you're working with some data, we have parallel invoke. Now, the supply thing is one of my extension methods. Um, it just runs that particular method and, and returns void. Parallel invoke says, given these items, do something potentially on another thread. You, when you start talking about the task parallel library, you hear things like potential parallelism all the time. <coughs> Because a task parallel library is more than just kicking off new threads. It's understanding your underlying system resources and saying, do I even have resources available to kick off a new thread? If I were to kick off a new thread, given what I think the workload is about to be, would it be faster to just run it synchronously? So it does a lot of those things behind the scenes. And you can override that behavior. Chances are, if you're thinking you need to override that behavior, you're probably doing it wrong. So usually the built-in scheduler is more than sufficient. But what are we doing here? Ratios, select, do resize. So I'm mapping my ratios to new images, converting it to an array, and then I'm doing that all in parallel. Remember, when we're working with link, we're talking about deferred execution. So it doesn't do it right away. It does it when you actually iterate and enumerate. Two array does not execute it. Two array does, but I'm doing the, uh, it's returning, a, this. in this case, I'm actually returning a delegate. So I'm not invoking it. I'm returning oh, okay. delegates. And we can see that. I was just getting up to scroll that. So what is the return type? It's func, accepts a double, returns an action. So I iterate over my ratios. I convert them. Not into images, but into a delegate to execute later. And then I execute those. A couple of things you'll notice are different than the previous examples, though. What's missing in run? Yeah, we don't have any countdown anymore. Why not? Why not? Why don't I need it? So if I run this. There we go. So yeah, so we just proved we don't need it. This actually took 1.92 seconds. Parallel invoke implicitly waits. It says, I are, I've got these tasks I need to run. And I'm going to wait for them to all finish. That's pretty nice. I like that. Because it means I don't have to think about what blocking mechanism I'm going to use. I don't need to decide, is it a semaphore? Is it a signal? Or is it a, is it a countdown? There's numerous different blocking mechanisms. All that control that. And this just says, I'll use what's best. I like it. It's more expressive. We're, 